I read a lot of biographies back then. So between the age of, I think nine to, I, I've been an avid reader all my life. That's another important quality that I think has it been instrumental for my success. We have our four values, which are right, right, right. right. So we talk about these, and we, you know, we obviously talk about why it's important to imbibe these values very early in your student journey itself before you end up going to the professional world or become a startup founder. The proportion of impact that you create is going to be entirely dependent on the pace at which you can make change happen. Usually, when we think about an idea, we think that already some people have done it, or we could have some better ideas that can come up in the future. So how to stick to one idea? This is amazing. Um, I got a tour of the campus this morning and uh, and now I have an opportunity to sort of catch up with all of you folks. Um, happy to answer pretty much any questions. Don't be uh, hesitant. Feel free to ask anything you feel like. Personal, professional, um, technical, whatever it might be. I'll try and answer the best of my ability and, and uh, completely honestly to the extent that I can uh, provide some guidance and assistance and any, any form of mentorship, more than happy to do that. And yeah, with that, let's get started. I know some of the questions you shared earlier um, asked by various students, exciting and, and interesting too. So I'm happy to share my perspective, folks. So, um, but yeah, great to see, great to see everybody uh, um, out here and, and great to connect with all of you folks. Great. So, so Mr. Bhavan um, and Anshuman sir and Abhimanyu Sachi go long back. Uh, they've known each other for almost 15 years now. Yeah, I did internship in 2009. <laughs> 2009. So, right. 14 years. So 14 years now. Um, so, and, and uh, you know, Bhavan, of course, is a very, very well known name uh, in the Indian ecosystem, uh, one of the most perfect founders, uh, multiple different startups, uh, all super successful. Um, so, it's been it's been an amazing, you know, experience just interacting. We've been actually interacting with Bhavan since morning. He's been kind enough to actually spend an entire day with us. Um, and since about 10 in the morning, we've been looking at the micro campus, we've been talking about how we can make the program a lot more effective for all of you, how do we improve on experiences. Um, so it's just been an amazing interaction with him so far. I'm very happy to have him here join us again. Thank you so much. Uh, let's start off with learning a little bit about your educational journey, right? What has been your educational journey and how are you as a student? Uh, I know you've taken some radical uh, decisions in your journey as well, but would you like to just share that with the students? Sure, happy to share that. So, um, so born and raised in Mumbai. Well, actually, my parents are originally from Gujarat. Um, uh, we come from a you know fairly humble beginning. My dad moved to um, Mumbai, I guess, a few years before I was born, and then has spent most of my life, early life, until about 13 in Mumbai. And then after, I started living abroad, and combination of India and abroad, etc. And um, yeah, we actually, you know, I schooled. I lived. I lived. Anybody here? Are folks here from anybody from Mumbai? There's a bunch of you folks, right? Okay, brilliant. Yeah. So, so early years, we actually lived near Martin. In fact, uh, as I said, came from humble. I mean, everything I am, by, by the way, today, both me and my younger brother, who's also a successful entrepreneur in his own right, and, and one of those brilliant people that that I've had the chance to work with. Um, everything that we are is 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 a lot thanks to kind of the um, upbringing that our parents were able to give us. Um, they they came from fairly humble beginnings, but uh, they spent no expense in terms of making sure that there were books always available to read, that we had good quality education to the extent possible and, and so on and so forth. Um, in early years in Mumbai, I schooled in in, uh, in Mahunga, that's where we lived. We actually lived, I mean, a few folks have seen the, the faculty room here because we spent most of the morning there. Um, so the first eight years of my life, because my father has, had just started, he's a chartered accountant by the way, by profession, um, and he had just started um, his first job in, uh, in Mumbai. And so we were living actually in a, joint family, so about 10 of us um, in a two bedroom house. And the one room that was allocated to four of us, me, my younger brother, my mom and dad, exactly the same size as the faculty room. So that's really where we started from, um, started our journey from. Um, finally, I think by the time I was eight, my, my parents, my father managed to sort of buy his first house, which is a big deal in Mumbai as, as anybody will uh, attest to. And uh, and so we finally moved to Andheri, and I joined another school there, uh, and then eventually started schooling in in Aryabhatta on the Bandra. I've always been extremely passionate about, and still am, about you know math and physics. So that's kind of how my you know uh, foray into computer science started. So in, in school they um, set up a computer room in uh, 1989. So I was in sixth standard at that point. I was 10 years old, 
and um, I mean, I, I was just hooked. This was pre-internet days, by the way, you know, um, 8286 microprocessor or ZX Spectrums, and we were programming on C, C++ on MS-DOS. There was no Windows. Um, so GW Basic and C, C++ on MS-DOS. Um, and I spent, we couldn't still afford a computer back at home. So I would spend almost all my time, lunch breaks, short breaks, PT periods, and um, several hours after school, just sitting and programming in the computer. And my dad must have bought, I think, no less than 30 to 40 different books cons consistently, consecutively, on programming in different languages. And literally all I would do is pick up a book, start reading it, go to the computer room, try out a bunch of techniques, try and write my own programs, and repeat day in, day out. So, so I still remember my school computer programming teacher. Her name was uh, Jayanti Miss, uh, probably the only teacher who liked me in school. And um, and she would, it also helped that, that I was in a boys only school, so no distractions. Uh, but but I, I would spend, I literally so I would spend all my time, she would give, she would leave the, there were about two or three of us that were like very curious about computer science. And she would leave the um, the keys to the computer room with us because school would shut down at 4 p.m. And then from 4 p.m. to about 6.30 p.m., we would just be there sitting and programming and then take the triple two bus back from Baba Hospital back to four bungalows where we live. Uh, and this was literally a daily routine. So back then, early on itself, I figured out that really I want to build my career in something to do with computer science. The other thing that I, I read a lot of biographies back then. So between the age of, I think, nine to, I, I've been an avid reader all my life. That's another important quality that I think has it been instrumental for my success and was inculcated again by my father. My father would just, he would just spend so much money on books. He would get scolded all the time by mom because, I mean, we bought, he would buy like every single week, there'd be like five or six new random books that he would just buy. Even if it didn't matter, it had nothing to do with the curriculum or whatever. Even when it came to school curriculum, obviously we had our standards that are textbooks, you know, for chemistry, physics, biology, whatever not. And then for every subject, he'd go and buy five more textbooks, so written by different authors. He's like, you have to read different perspectives from different people, you know. And so he inculcated this habit very, very early on um, of like reading a lot. And and so I read a lot of biographies back then. And I read tons of biographies. That, that was a time when eventually then Microsoft started becoming popular. There were tons of biographies on Bill like Gates and Microsoft, Apple, IBM, Xerox. Um, Oracle, and then even, you know, non-tech like Chrysler Corp, McDonald's, there's tons and tons of biographies. And I was very, very inspired at an early age um, that I want to make a difference. I um, I want to do something on my own. I want to, um, you know, be an entrepreneur. And um, both me and my younger brother, we started doing sort of ad hoc assignments for random companies, you know, write some software programs or install computers or build out networks or things that go on like tiny amount of pocket money um, back then. And and then yeah, that led to the journey afterwards. But so, I, so I schooled in, in AVM, then I moved to Rupert to do my junior college, right? Um, uh, my 11th and 12th. Um, and then at that point, I was kind of, um, I mean, I, I, I had been an autodidact all my life, which is another skill that I, I think is very, very important. The, the conference, um, and the notion that you can pretty much learn anything on your own. This is, by the way, pre-internet, pre-YouTube, right? Um, all of your learning takes place through books, actually. Um, so I, I've spent all my, most of my formative years in, in learning everything that I learned uh, just by reading, just by reading books and material. Now, I mean, there's so many tools accessible to all of us. I think it's, you know, we can all engage in a far more accelerated path to learning, but it was uh, um, structured learning through books. And, uh, so I, I clearly, I was clear that I wanted to do something in computer science. And I, I, and I, I've never been, uh, I've been academically inclined, but more sort of pursuing my own path in general. Um, but obviously everybody told me that 10th standard is like very, very important. I think still the case, right? Everybody stresses about 10th standard and 12th standard. It's very important to sort of define the rest of your life. And as a kid, you know, you, you like influenced, um, by what people around you tell you, you know, tell you. And so, uh, I studied fairly hard and, got a good grade and then, you know, um, I was on the merit list for my 10th and then got into this great college. Um, I learned there, by the way, in most of these institutions that um, a large chunk of the success of these students there has almost nothing to do with the quality of the curriculum, but much rather the selection criteria, how they let people in. Um, and so, you know, you've got the best students there, you automatically get the best results, right? But I got quite disillusioned with the education system. I, sh I should, you know, um, I should say largely because of what I 
I mean, a lot of the computer science stuff that I had read and learned on my own, when I looked at all the engineering curriculum, I'm like, this is stuff that I did back in school by myself. And I, I knew I wanted to do something in computer science and something on my own. And I was like, I'm not going to, and I, I don't want you to necessarily get inspiration exactly from these examples. <laughs> but I was like, I can't waste four years in engineering. I really want to start now. And the stuff they teach you all there. I love the math and physics. I would have pretty much joined an engineering college to, to learn some of the advanced math and physics. I, did, I studied for my ITJ, and that was the most fun um, I had actually in terms of learning stuff um, outside of the regular 11th and 12th curriculum, which is sort of relatively um, less complex in comparison. And uh, and then I just I started, you know, in my 12th standard, I, I so we convinced uh, why well, convinced my father that that I'm not going to continue um, in my 11th. I can I convinced him I'm not going to continue um, in engineering. And and I'll start something on my own. And my parents were like, you've got to get some degree and whatever not, you know. Um, Indian parents are not going to easily let let you sort of choose a path that doesn't involve some academic certification. <laughs> and uh, and they eventually did get convinced finally. And they're like, okay, we'll let you choose your own path. But then in 12th, I again became a medicalist holder and I had a seat in an engineering college. So once again, the pressure started. And I remember this, you know, phase of about three months in between. So I, I, I by the way, then switched to BCom. I joined Sydney and I, uh, I literally I never went to Sydney has this, um, I don't know again if anybody knows about the institution, but has this saying that Sydney has the most outstanding students in, in Mumbai, which is always standing outside college. They never, <laughs> never, never really inside. So they don't really care about attendance or, or anything. So I, I really spent, I spent my time building my first company throughout that, um, uh, throughout those years, early years of college. Um, but yeah, there was a space when, you know, uh, because I had the ability to sort of get into any engineering college of, of my choice, that my, my parents, and they, to their credit, on the one hand, they were very disappointed at that point that I chose not to go down that path, but they never enforced a decision on us. Um, they were always like, we will show you the way, we will do, and they did a lot to try and direct us in a certain path, but they're like, you've got to make your own mistakes, you've got to learn on your own, and no matter what, we'll support you. So, I mean, I think when you have that as a support system, you really have the confidence to take decisions with conviction. And, you know, there was this phase, as I said, but there was this phase where they would, uh, you know, it's like randomly people would show up for dinner whose son was an engineer or, you know, daughter was studying somewhere or whatever not for, for dinner conversation about how it's so great to get into an engineering school. Uh, but I was, I was like stubborn, basically. I was like, no, I'm very clear. This is just a waste of time and I'm going to do stuff on my own. So we then started. Me and my younger brother, we started uh, Direct Eye, which was our first company, which we ran for about 14 years and sold it. And then, uh, finally, then I've started three other companies that I currently now um, run and operate. So yeah, that's early schooling. Wow. Uh, extremely inspiring. Um, in 1989 is when Bhavan first started playing with his uh, computer. Most of you were not born, right? 1989. <laughs> <laughs> I was just making me feel <laughs> <laughs> uh, But but what but I think what's amazing is the fact that there was a very high level of clarity on what you wanted, right? A lot of, a lot of um, a lot of students when they go through a journey, they're still discovering what they want to do, um, and you were very clear about the path you were taking. You were taking a big bet on yourself that this is the direction I'm going to go. I'm going to take a PCOM. And I'm going to start my own company. How did that clarity come about? Well, BCom was actually not a choice. My father eventually was like, okay, we'll let you do what you want, but you have to get some degree. So I just picked one, basically. You know, it, it could have been anything uh, for that matter. I'm actually glad, you know, I, I, uh, so I said I didn't really go to college, but I gave all the exams and, and made him happy. Um, and, and at least learned something along the way in accounting and economics, et cetera, is always useful in, uh, in business also. Um, I think a lot of the inspiration to want to start doing something, I mean, I strongly believe anybody can be an entrepreneur. In fact, I even, even more firmly believe the earlier in your life you start, you know, it's, it's far better because there's no risk, right? I mean, I had no risk at that point. What's the worst that could happen? I'll try something for three years and I will fail. And, you know, my parents are still there. I still go home. I still have food on the table. They're not going to kick me out or anything, at least in India, that doesn't happen. So, uh, so there's really no risk. You know, when you grow older, you, you know, got family and you've got responsibilities, suddenly there's this whole notion of like risk and whatever not. So it's the least risky time to actually attempt entrepreneurship. Um, I was also, as I said, extremely inspired by all, all the biographies that I read and, and really one thing in common, well, several things in common. One is, 
you know, every one of them has gone through hardships and failures and downturns and uh, issues and so on and so forth. And really, you know, the um, the difference is, has been made by individuals who persisted because every failure teaches you something, you know, gets you closer and closer. It's kind of like, I think all of us have experienced this in, in trying to solve all these sort of complex problems during JE also, right? I remember the was that physics book, Irodo? Yeah. Yeah. Hell, man. And some of these problems take like, would take like a week before you get back, like figure out how to solve them, right? But every wrong solution is just taking you one step closer to the right solution. And uh, and uh, and the same thing happens in entrepreneurship, right? which is uh, the, the key difference is, is people who stick it out and, uh, and keep patting and have that persistence. And so that's why starting early helps because you've got kind of a longer path. In terms of making your mistakes, learning from your failures, and then uh, and then going down the right path. Uh, and so I, I I I mean I think reading all these books, I felt like all these individuals. I don't know somehow so from an early age, by the way. Um, well, there's two things I would say. One uh, one of the things that my father would keep telling us. Um, he's a huge optimist and very very positive um, disposition individual, and with a strong belief that he shared with us you know, unequivocally until we would get frustrated listening to it. It's like, you can achieve anything you set your mind. And it's a very simple statement, very, very simple statement, but you repeat it often enough and it becomes fundamentally a part of you. And you actually imbibe that, internalize that, and you strongly believe in that, right? That you can really truly achieve anything you set your mind, except, you know, outside of the uh, sort of within the constraints of the laws of physics. Um, but other than that, you know, I, I, I strongly and firmly do believe that. And um, and so that complemented with sort of um, all the inspiration that I got from these books. Um, I've also from an early age believed, and I, I think it applies to all of these sort of young minds here in this room, that each of us truly, I think, I think life is a gift. Right? I mean, um, it's an evolutionary gift, and the odds and the probability of um, of us sitting out here are so minuscule. Um, and, and I strongly believe that each of us has a of a moral obligation to make an impact that's proportionate to our potential. And uh, and every one of us starts with, you know, almost the same ingredients. And therefore, in many ways, outside the differences in opportunities, I and mean, all of you folks should consider yourselves very gifted because you have the opportunity to sort of participate in this great course um, and, and learn all this stuff. But we all have an obligation to make an impact that's proportionate to our potential. Um, and, and I always felt when I read all these sort of stories and books that, that I can make the highest possible impact um, by, by being an entrepreneur, by, by doing something myself, by creating job opportunities, by building products, by solving problems. And, um, and so that's kind of one one aspect, one you know um, factor. As I said, math and physics naturally led me into computer science. Um, I also think all of you folks are, you know, call it luck or choice. Um, history has demonstrated in the last 20 years and will continue to do in the next 20 to 30 years that actually computer science is is in many ways an opportunity. I mean, computer science, I would say in biotech and healthcare, um, to make a multitude exponential impact compared to almost any other field or industry because you have the opportunity to capitalize on the speed of technology um, to be able to, because the proportion of impact that you create is going to be entirely dependent on the pace at which you can make change happen. And the pace at which you can make change happen in, in computer science, because you're working with processors that work at a certain speed, and working with scalable systems that can that can provide you additional compute bandwidth that's literally infinite out there, you can substantially increase the pace at which you make an impact. So I mean, I chanced upon it because of my love for math and physics with the computer room that they installed in my school. But I think it was it was kind of a natural choice, and and so so it was clear to me that I do something in computer science. It had to be entrepreneurship, um, and and you know that that's how kind of that path uh, that path got chalked out. Um, I think what really stood out in our entire conversation and we just spoke about is that there were certain values that you imbibed very early in your childhood itself and through your college years and through your early career as well. And I'm sure many of them hold true today. And many of them shaped you to be the individual you are today as well. Why was it so important for you to discover those values and stick by it? Like, like we talk about this to our students. We have our four values, which are? Right. 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 So we talk about these and we you know we obviously talk about why it's important to imbibe these values very early in your student journey itself before you end up going to the professional world or become a startup founder 
Um, but I'm sure they've been a very important group for you as well. And how did that kind of become a big part of you? I, I think it's critically important for both companies and individuals to be value driven. Um, I mean, I think the probably in some ways that's what at least to a certain extent I do believe that you know fundamentally we're all extremely large computing machines. But even the, till this day today, I think that that still stands the distinction between I guess humans and computers, right? Um, which is you know, computers are largely behavior driven. You can program a certain behavior, and then you can expect the computers to kind of replicate that behavior. And now deep learning is kind of changing that. Um, I think it's changing it only to the point where you can't explain the behavior because the neural net is so deep that it becomes impossible to kind of backtrace as to why something happened. Um, you know, you you teach or you learn. By the way, I strongly believe values can be self-learned. I strongly believe it's also a choice that you make. Um, I strongly believe choosing the right values will actually make a difference to a lot of things in your life. It will make a difference to, you know, quantum of success. You know, for sure there are people who can still succeed in the absence of certain values, but I think it increases the probability because you finally live in a society of, of other human beings, etc. And eventually, you know, short-term gains will always be outweighed by long-term thinking. Um, I think it also substantially increases, you know, personal happiness. Uh, I think the, the quantum happiness that you derive with the right kind of values, et cetera, is, is um, far higher. Um, you're always accessing the kind of oxytocin and serotonin uh, neurotransmitters versus like dopamine or, or sort of short term, um, you know, um, neurotransmitters in terms of, sort of the personal happiness. Um, I think it make a significant difference to your growth. For instance, I, one of the values that I strongly believe in um, is humility. And I think that, you know, it's one thing about humility that okay, can perhaps make you more affable, people will respect you, whatever. But even from a pure selfish interest, knowing that there's so much you don't know and acknowledging that opens you up automatically to the path of like, let me go out there and learn, opens up, opens you up in terms of curiosity, opens you up in terms of, um, you know, going out there and seeking help and seeking assistance, whereas arrogance or, you know, the lack of humility will actually close you. You know, from a mindset standpoint, will close you to um, those opportunities to learn, etc. Right. So, so many of these values will actually substantially help in um, in that long-term journey. Um, I also feel it's the responsibility of institutions like this to inculcate the right values, or at least help people, you know, guide in the right way. You can um, you can guide people a hundred times about behaviors. There's a hundred different behaviors that you can go right or wrong in, but once you imbibe the right value the value automatically guides all your behaviors, all your actions. So, you know, I can tell you, hey, that action was wrong, that action was wrong, that action was wrong, or I can just tell you, hey, you know, try and enable you to sort of, you know, learn humility or or act with integrity. And um, if you learn that value, then all your actions will automatically, if you internalize the value, you truly deeply believe in that, it becomes part of you, then nobody needs to point out any action. Um, I have actually I have this utopian notion of of the world, which obviously we uh, can't necessarily realize. But to the extent that we can in our organizations or anything that I do, I try and imbibe it. it I believe that in a world that has a hundred percent transparency, evil cannot exist. The, the only reason why evil exists or anything wrong exists is because people perpetrating that have a belief that they can get away with it, that it won't be known. Um, but if you have 100% transparency, then by default, there can't be anything wrong. Or, or if there is, it's it's quite obvious that it is wrong because there's 100% transparency. In it. So there are some of these fundamental principles I feel that will make the world a much better place. And not just for everybody else, but for you to live in um, a much better place, right? Um, at the end of the day, you have to sleep with yourselves. You know, you have to live with yourselves. You have to sleep with, like, all of those aspects are just with you, right? So, so, so there's a, you know, general kind of value system that that everybody forms over time and you, you make the right choices to kind of form that value system that will serve you. In fact, it's that one thing that will serve you through the through your entire life is the values that you imbibe and the values that you live by. Basically. Um, I've again had the good fortune of both, you know, led by example by my parents. I think, you know, 
my dad's a very principled person and, and there's a lot of values. I mean, I, even when he had nothing and, and had significant responsibilities because of his children, because of the you know family, I have seen him never compromise on his integrity. I've seen him make choices uh, to short term detriment um, so as to not compromise on those principles, so as to not compromise on those values. And, uh, and you know, I can say proudly that I've, I have therefore been able to invite those. And more often than not, I've seen that in any long term time period that, um, that the right values will always sort of um, um, benefit you in terms of growth, in terms of success, but also in terms of self fulfillment, you know, happiness and all those areas. Great. Um, I think also I just want to quickly touch upon the support system that you had. I already spoke a lot about how your parents were a big support system for you. Your brother was a big support system for you. Your own values, stuff that you learned through books, um, through the entire journey, and you've you know started so many companies, all one successful than the other. Um, what other support system that you had you know, as mentors or maybe other forms of support system that really helped you in this journey? I mean, I will candidly say, if you ask me, one of the things that I should have done better is actually to create and leverage a external support system. I didn't. Um, I, I've always been very, very sort of focused on learning stuff myself, reading up online resources. I'm a firm believer of structured learning, by the way. And it, it sounds odd because I just, you know, two answers ago, I spoke about sort of dropping out of college. But dropping out of college at that point had nothing to do with you know, not subscribing to structured education. Like I strongly believe in curriculums and discipline, in structure. If somebody spent time and effort in creating a a um, you know method to sort of accelerate the path to clarity, um, I'll be the first one to take it. Even now, I spend a lot of my time these days. The flavor. I mean, I, I've spent a lot of my time picking up subjects that that I am interested in and, and kind of going through structured learning courses on 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 each of them. So whether it's you know molecular biology or physics or these days it's all LLMs and, and deep learning. But my general principle is on doing you know two courses on Coursera on you know NLP and, and deep learning. I just I strongly believe in in subscribing to structured learning. So the absence of that the or the, the reason for me to sort of prescribe dropping out at that point in time was that I felt that that structured learning curriculum was not to my satisfaction. Because I felt that it would actually, you know, take away four years of my life without giving me adding much to to me. But but I've always fundamentally been a uh, a um, um, believer in structured learning per se. I'm sorry, I didn't, didn't support system. support system. Yeah. So yeah. so I spend most of my time learning on my own. Um, I think that's a mistake, by the way, because the one thing that structured learning doesn't provide you is the wisdom of experience of other people of the failures they've made and how they've learned from mistakes. But unfortunately, curriculums don't cover mistakes. They cover a lot of theory, they cover a lot of practicals, but they don't cover here's the situation that took place, the mistake that I made, and you don't get to learn and leverage. So I had to unfortunately learn a lot from first principles and making those mistakes myself. And it's, it's you know, my advice would be that if you find people who are way smarter than you, leverage them appropriately. You know, a one hour conversation with somebody Go with the purpose. You know, a lot of entrepreneurs come to me for guidance sometimes for mentorship and they're smart on their own. It's mostly experience sharing that's taking place, right? And my general, you know, my general um, advice to them is, okay, you want to have a discussion, make an agenda, put down a list of questions, and then let's sit for that hour and we'll make it as productive as possible. Uh, but know what you want, but definitely surround yourselves with people. I mean, I also had, you know, on the one hand, Good fortune of the fact that all of my companies have been bootstrapped, um, except Zero, where we, uh, in Zero, we raised a, a large round. And even there, I mean, I put in 40 million of my personal capital to start the company. Um, we only raised money, you know, two years ago. Um, so until Zero, actually, I haven't even had a, a board technically, right? I own the company along with my younger brother or second one I own by myself. So I didn't really have a board and we have board advisors. There's merit in all of those, but there are advantages that I believe that I lost out on that, um, I mean, there are benefits of having bootstrap, the benefits of that first principles thinking, but there are certainly disadvantages also. And and, and I would certainly, you know, um, some of the best entrepreneurs in the world have had some really good coaches that have helped them along the way. And and, and I think that that's, that would be a great thing if you find those individuals. They can change over time. So yeah, on my part, I mean, I think from a principles and values and those kinds of things, I've had the right upbringing, right company. But for most of my, you know, actual knowledge, it came from books. 
my 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 you know my learning has all been from resources that I read. Um, okay. So I do want to make sure we have enough time to take questions from students, and there are a lot of questions, and you know some of them have also already filled the Google form that was shared, and we already saw some questions as well. But I do have a couple more before we take it to the audience. Um, you know, you 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 spoke about a journey. So there's this direct that you started with. Uh, you now have three companies running in parallel as well. You have Flocks, you have Radix, you have Titan, uh, you have Zeta. Um, what keeps you going? Why why this hunger of starting more companies and solving different problems? You know, many of them, there are many entrepreneurs out there who had one successful exit and they probably would, you know, take their money and maybe just travel to Europe and, and live a good life. But what keeps you going? Uh, why new problems every time and why start again? Um, you know, so I, I I kind of go back a couple of things I can say. One is I can kind of go back to the statement I made earlier. I, I innately believe that each of us have a moral obligation to make an impact proportionate to our potential. Um, and, and I think that I still have a long way to go. I, I think I can make a much bigger impact than what I've made so far, and, and I intend to spend the rest of my life in that journey. Um, you know, I, I have a certain access, and I've been asked this question, you know, when we had our first exit, me and my younger brother, we owned the company in Dali. We had an exit for $160 million. Uh, pretty sizable, life-changing amount of money. Um, technically, I don't really need to work uh, a single other day. By the way, we made this calculation at some point. I mean, I early on in my life when uh, when I uh, um, when I had a first exit, and, and I'm like, you know, pretty much to support my current standard of living, and I have, most of my expenses are actually rent for houses that I have across multiple locations because I keep traveling across all of them. That's actually almost 40% of my uh, personal p and is, is just rent and, and some staff. But like I made a calculation that, you know, beyond 20, 25 million, I couldn't really spend money. There's really nothing I can spend on unless I, and I have no desire to go out there and acquire, you know, planes and boats and assets and stuff like that. Really, I have no personal desire. So from a pure expense standpoint, you know, I could literally live the rest of my life and I wouldn't have to work a single additional day um, with just a 20, 25 million dollar sort of base capital, put in some risk free, you know, investment and, and that should be more than enough to lead a very, very comfortable life. And, and I know that also is a life changing one money for a, for a lot of people, but I'm saying in comparison to, you know, where we currently are. So for me, it's, as I said, it's, I think it's, you know, I'm passionate about problem solving. I think I have the opportunity to make a much bigger impact, so I'll continue at it. Um, out of selfish interest, I would say, and this is going back to kind of, you know, it's actually evolutionary biology, um, to be honest. You know, if you go back to this whole notion of, uh, you know, there's four happiness hormones, right? You know, endorphins, uh, oxytocin, serotonin, and, and dopamine. And um, all this stuff, you know, even selling selling your company for $160 million, you know, we had a $900 million exit, we did not met, and then um, all the other companies that we now have, um, it's momentary pleasure. It's like it's fleeting. It's you know it, it, it doesn't really last. You know, it's not like oh I, I did something and now suddenly the happiness or achievements will last me the rest of my life. It's not. It's never going to last the rest of your life, right? Um, all of these are, are um, you know dopamine kicks, right? It's a momentary fleeting pleasure of a variable success that you essentially uh, felt at that point in time at that moment in time. And that applies to all the other stuff you mentioned: a trip to Europe, or buying a fancy car, or um, all of these are momentary pleasures, but building something, solving problems, making an impact, these are long-lasting happiness measures. They are long-lasting pleasures. I have not found a single substitute for creating stuff that gives you the same level of joy and the same level of happiness. So forget making an impact, which is a goal that I have. Even if it's purely of self-interest, really there's nothing you can do, you know, all this stuff once, twice, thrice. Um, um, it, you know, I hadn't had a, um, more than a three day or a four day vacation the last 25 years in my life, except last year. And all of my vacations are, I call them vacations. Um, I've got this, um, you know, format, even, even if I'm going on like a skiing trip or whatever, not, it's basically, um, sort of flanking weekends vacation. So I'll go to a place, you know, two weekends I can use for skiing in the middle five days. I've got an office set up there and. And I'm working out there, right? basically, because there is really nothing more exciting than solving problems. I mean, I can't like I get to I my job is puzzle solving every day. 
it's like playing a video game every day. There is no alternative substitute. There is really no alternative substitute that will give you the same degree and sense and level of fulfillment. And once you feel that high and you get that pleasure and you derive that excitement and enjoyment every day, like none of this stuff like going on a trip somewhere or buying something fancy can even compare to that joy of being able to create constantly and build something constantly and solve problems on a daily basis and meet smart people on a daily basis and learn something new every single day from people around you. That, that is actually far more long lasting happiness. So even from a selfish perspective, I, I feel like even if there wasn't an outcome or an impact, this is still the path that I would choose. I was just truly, truly inspired by Bhavid. Uh, and actually inspired by Bhavid, we are cancelling the trimester break. <laughs> <laughs> Alright, no. Um, I'll tell you actually on that note, by the way, um, I think that was one of the questions that I think from the students list or your list that was there. Watch this uh, break. What, you know, what should we do in the breaks or, or what should... I'll tell you, by the way, that one of the other reasons that, or one of the other... Um, I know sort of being a student can be very stressful. I have no doubt about it. I've been through that bit more myself, but I also am on the interviewing side many times and, you know, campus placements and lateral interviews, et cetera. And I know that I can sense um, the level of stress that people go through, right? But I'll tell you one thing that a large part of who I am, a large part of my success depended on a lot on how I spent my time outside of my school and college curriculum versus just what I did in my school and college curriculum, right? Um, and so how you choose to spend that time, whether it's places, you know, my my dad, that's the other reason why you buy five or six different books for each subject. But one of the principles you would have is they would try and finish about 25 to 30% of the school curriculum during the summer vacations. Like you would just read all the books in advance before school started. Um, and it's just, it's something he inculcated in us as a, as a habit. Um, and so, yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think it's definitely important to have a break time. I do not recommend cancelling trimester breaks, but how you utilize it um, is, is obviously a choice that you folks make. And and I'll tell you the quantum success um, later on in life, because success, the other thing about success also, it's compounding, right? I mean, think about AI, think about any progress in life, it's compounding. You're, it's, you know, all of us are familiar with layers of abstraction. Humanity progresses at a more and more rapid pace because we have the ability to leverage on previous abstractions and we can operate in a higher layer and, and sort of compound that, right? Um, and, you know, Compounding is purely a function of time. So the earlier on you spend more time in investing in yourself, the later in life you have to spend lesser and lesser time. Actually, you will be more relaxed and you have lesser stress and you have the ability to sort of take that and compound it further, basically. Compound that investment that you made in yourself, uh, in yourself further. Excellent. Well, um, again, inspiring words. Last question before we open it up for our students here. But what got excited to visit Skills for Technology today? Why meet? Uh, our students, I know you've been in touch with Anshuman and Abhimani for a while, but what inspired you to be here today and spend the day with us? I'm deeply passionate about education. I think that, uh, I think it's the biggest equalizer. Um, I think that if every individual on this planet had, we ha is given the same opportunity in terms of quality education, um, then everybody has truly the opportunity to make a meaningful impact. And I think the, the, difference between, you know, majority, which is why I say, I think all of you should consider yourselves extremely privileged, you know, both because of the, you know, your parents, your upbringing and, and what got you here, you should consider yourselves extremely privileged because uh, um, large majority of the, the world doesn't have access to quality education. Um, I think it's a birthright. I think every individual should have access to great quality education. Then the choices that they make are also shaped by experiences and people and um, parents and upbringing and friends and everybody else, but at least that access is, is I think, by default, should be everybody's birthright. And, um, you know, that's an area I definitely want to sort of make, you know, meaningful contribution to. I have to the extent that I can in the past, you know, we started Code Chef with, uh, with that goal and ambition to a certain extent that we sort of uh, coding community and, and my goal is to kind of spend um, some time to whatever time and whatever resources I can on an ongoing basis to kind of contribute to the field. So, so that's why I'm equally excited being here, sort of seeing all of you. Um, I'm a strong believer in, in sort of um, physical presence and interacting with people, you know, in, in real time. It's, it's again ironic because 90% of my um, year comprises of Zoom calls. Um, and it's only sort of 10 to 15% of the time that I get to actually physically interact with people just because of my travel. 
uh, but I really cherish those moments when I do. Um, and so, yeah, I'm, I'm really glad that I could uh, take this time. I know, you know, Anshu and Manu and me, a bunch of us spoke a bunch of times, and I said, next time I'm in Bangalore, I'll carve out some time, and, and fortunately, you know, it turned out that we could do that this uh, this week. And thank you for, on such a short notice, setting everything up. Uh, really appreciate that. Um, and then the warm welcome and the hospitality show. All right, with that, we'll open up to questions from our students. Uh, I know there are a ton of them. There are actually a lot of questions I could have asked you also about your entrepreneurial journey, about your startups, which you did not, because I know our students have them already. So we have about 35 responses to the Google form uh, that was circulated. Um, why don't we have those students raise your hands, and I'll pick one by one, and they can come up. Uh, maybe just come up till here. Uh, talk a little bit louder. Just introduce yourself, just your name, and maybe which town you come from, and then ask a question. All right, so can we have the... The hands up for those who uh, ask the questions on Google Form. So you can just state your name and what city you're from and then state your question. Good evening, everyone. I am from, uh, my name is Pratit Pogla and I am from Dibugar Assam. So my question was regarding uh, ideas, right? So usually people have difficulty sticking to even one idea. But as we have seen, you have started multiple companies and max all of them are successful. So how do you stick on an idea? Like, uh, usually, when we think about an idea, we think that already some people have done it. Or we could have some better ideas that can come up in the future. So, how to stick to one? That's it. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you for your question. I've never had a chance to visit Assam. It's a beautiful, beautiful place and I hope at some point I do. Um, it's great to see people from all over the place uh, sample out here. Um, I would not by the way, recommend starting multiple companies to anyone. Um, and again, it sounds ironic, like this. I am sitting out here. I have had the uh, I have had the uh, the good fortune of an amazing team that has, that's actually been with me. So if I you know look at Radix, um, I now have a CEO and a team since last six seven years. The entire leadership team have worked with me for seventeen years, eighteen years, fifteen years. So amazing people that actually bear the brunt of all the weight. So really, all the credit goes to them. Starting companies is kind of like raising children in some sense, right? You know, the early stages, you're very excited about raising your baby. By the time they go a teenager, they don't need you anymore. And uh, and then it's all about, hey, I, think I wasn't invited to that party, or I wasn't invited to that outing. I'm like, we don't need you here. Um, but, uh, but I've had the good fortune, even with Zeta, I have an amazing co-founder. He's worked with me. We've worked together, actually, for about 15 years now, um, all together. In, in Titan, I have um, um, actually Kalpesh, who's the CTO and Nanath will be for about 16 years. Kalpesh for 20, I think 23 years, 22 years with me. Right? So um, so I've had the good fortune of having some really amazing people for whatever reason trust me and have been with me for a long period of time. Um, I strongly believe in the um, in the power of focus. So um, so I would you know I would say that that's actually critically important. Um, uh, in fact, I think in many cases, the job of a great CEO or a great, you know, product person is almost invariably 89% of their job is to point out things that you shouldn't do rather than to point out things that you should do. Um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's some really interesting blog articles also on this. this is one by uh, Frankie Snoopman, the um, guy who started ServiceNow, and um, another one by Kissmetrics uh, founder of like the um, dangers of defocusing and doing too many things. In fact, as an engineer, um, it's actually one of the biggest unfortunate concerns is that you live in a world where anything is possible and you know ideas keep coming to you and it's very, very easy to get distracted. And um, so I do think that, I think that, so I'll actually sort of lengthen this answer a little bit, talk a little bit about this whole notion of discovery also, right? Um, this other lesson that I've kind of learned along the way, and I wish somebody had told this to me early on, I wish I had realized early on, etc., is that the quantum impact that you make, uh, funnily enough, is obviously it's proportionate to the amount of work that you put in, effort that you put in, you know, most entrepreneurs that I know of burn the midnight oil, hard work, etc. But interestingly, the it's it's far more proportionate to the problem space that you select. So we all can work, you know, 24-7 or 14 by 7 or whatever, you know, have you. But the quantum impact that we make in the world it is going to be far more dependent on, in many cases, being in the right place at the right time and discovering that opportunity or choosing the right problem space. 
And so I do believe that it's kind of like digging wells or um, the what is that multi-arm bandit problem, right? Which is basically you know in computer science we talk about this whole notion of uh, uh, ex exploit exploration and exploitation. So so in that idea, you know, focusing on an idea, you can also go drastically wrong if you too quickly pick an idea and then say, okay, fine, I'm going to spend the rest of my life on this. What if you picked wrong? It's like picking the wrong girlfriend. Right, you, if you want to spend the rest of life with them, right? So, so there is a period of dating, if you will, in ideas also, right? There's an exploration period, um, and during the exploration period, you need to have clarity in terms of what you're seeking, you know, figuring out you're picking the right path. And a lot of entrepreneurs make the mistake of not spending adequate time in exploration, where you have to dig many shallow wells to figure out which one's going to give oil, and then after that, focus all your freaking energies to extract almost every ounce of oil from that particular well. So you do want to go through that phase in the idea selection time frame um, and learn along the way and figure out, okay, well, this is the place I'm going to sort of um, spend my focus on. Um, and then, uh, and, and it's another thing also, you know, I love our industry, by the way, because our industry in many ways come up with all these interesting terminology for, you know, in, 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 in the, in the um, startup, tech startup um, uh, economy or the industry, there's no such thing as failure, right? We kind of reframe it, we call it pivot. So nobody fails, you just pivot. And I'm saying that also don't be shy if you figure out the well you're digging actually doesn't have oil and pausing and changing direction. Uh, but then at that point also it's important to have that retrospective of well, why did I pick this after all the exploration? What assumptions went wrong for me to pick this wrong opportunity and spend so much time on it? I've spent a lot of time digging the wrong wells. And that's another common problem with entrepreneurs. You get so attached to the idea and not necessarily to the outcome that you end up spending more time than otherwise you should um, in, 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 in the wrong path. Right? But outside of all that, once you do find that right path, that right problem, and there are enough frameworks, by the way, now, you know, back in the day, we didn't have stuff to guide us. So there's so many acronyms and frameworks you can use now to evaluate ideas in a rapid way, in an adequate way. Um, and then pick the right one and, and, and pursue it. But once you do, then I would, I'm a strong proponent of saying, you know, focus on that idea. And I said, I fortunately have people who handle that day to day and are 100% dedicated to, you know, my co-founder and Zeta, 100% of his life is Zeta. My CEO and Radix, that's 100% of his life. My leadership team in Titan, that's 100% of their life. Um, and, and, and they're amazing. I mean, I, I learn from them every day. So I have that opportunity and that, that benefit. But otherwise, that focus will always give you far higher in life. Yeah, don't think that Bhavan just dug five holes and found oil in all of them. I'm sure he dug many more, more than that. Five five. Yeah. More money in digging holes than anything else. <laughs> Alright, next question. Come on. Hello, sir. My name is Darju. Uh, you recently got called out that Pentec is a fallacy. So I wanted to know like, what's your perspective being a Zeta founder, Pentec company founder. It's a way to become funny. Like, what are the upcoming trends and opportunities in the Pentec sector, in the BFS side? I'm from Latur Maharashtra. Pleasure meeting you, Arjun. Thank you for that question. Pleasure meeting you. Um, I, I mean, I'll take a bit of a segue from the previous answer. By the way, every time I've started a new company or a new business, or even a new product with a new business, um, I go through this whole phase, I call it kind of homework phase, right? Planning, then discovery, then scaling and steady state. And so the planning phase, in Zeta, actually, when me and my co-founder started Zeta, we started with a healthy dose of delusion and complete ignorance and no knowledge about the space. Right? So pretty much everything was unknown for us. Banking, finance, zero, zero, zero idea. And we spent almost a year doing um, what we call homework, quote unquote, you know, discussing stuff, discussing ideas, discussing thoughts, and so on and so forth. And I, I believe there's a stage of what I call fundamental clarity, and it takes a different amount of time to get to that stage and depending on the size, scope, and scale of the industry, which is, you know, you start out by knowing that you know nothing. Um, so actually, even the known knowns set is zero. Um, and you start learning, and over time, you decide, you, you uncover more and more known unknowns, and, and then eventually unknown unknowns become known unknowns. And you get to a stage where you're, and, and at first, the whole thing seems overwhelming, much like how the curriculum at scalar might seem, right, when you look at it for four years. But over time, you start getting this fundamental clarity. And as I said, everything compounds eventually on, on pre previous knowledge. And so uh, it took a while, but we got to a stage of like knowing everything to know sort of about the financial services industry. 
I call out fintech as a fallacy because of much abuse term. But we don't consider Zeta as a fintech at all. We consider Zeta as a uh, technology service provider. So in the financial services industry, I would say that you are fundamentally dividing opportunities into um, two or three buckets. Uh, one bucket, I call it the, the manufacturing bucket, which is that you're manufacturing financial products or services. Uh, for which you have to be a bank, you have to have a license. You can't just go out there and start getting deposits and loans as a company. You actually have to get a license. It's a regulated business. It has cap return on equity. You know, there's you know clear regulations on how you should financially operate metrics, you know, liquidity ratios and debt to income ratios and um, um, capital adequacy ratios and so on and so forth. It's a very, very well engineered, well structured business. That's why, by the way, for the most part, you almost never see banks failing except when there's a massive catastrophe of some sort, basically. Like there, there's a formula, it's a, literally a mathematical equation, but it's a manufacturing business, you get a license, and then you innovate on, banking is actually, it's actually a balance sheet business about managing risk. It's, a, it's, a, it's fundamentally a risk management business. You're managing risk on underwriting, saying who do I give a loan to? You're managing risk on fraud, saying, you know, I don't want to accumulate fraudsters. You're managing risk on interest rates, saying that, okay, this is what I'm charging. On my loan, and this is what I'm, you know, giving to my savings account or deposit holders. It's, it's entirely a risk management and a balance sheet business, which has a very different characteristic from a tech business. That's part of the other reason why I called out fintech as fallacy because, you know, you can't be a venture fund or an investor investing in a fintech thinking is going to get the same disproportionate returns that a Google or a Uber or any pure tech company would because they are not balance sheet businesses, whereas a bank is a balance sheet business. Right? So you've got the manufacturing bucket. Most fintechs, to be honest, to me, sit in the second bucket that I call the distribution bucket, which is they're actually resellers of manufacturers. So when you look at a, you know, examples like a Jupiter or a Cred or any of these companies, when they're selling financial services, they're not manufacturing them themselves. They don't have license to. So essentially, reselling some bank service, whether it's an Access Bank or a Federal Bank or an HDFC Bank or whatever not, until you get your own license. Once you get your own license, you become a manufacturer. Then once again, you're a balance sheet business. So that's the second bucket. And you might have a niche there. You might say that because banks can't serve everybody. To me, banking is like an infrastructure business. But the needs of a small business when it comes to financial services was an enterprise. The needs of a commercial card versus a retail credit card. The needs of a student versus a you know mature 55 year old are very different and a bank can't cater to all those needs they're not product companies they're financial service companies to me that's really where the niche of fintechs is and i believe the real fintechs that will succeed or that do succeed are the ones that figure out a persona and a problem and say okay i'm going to take that manufactured product it's fundamentally still a loan or a deposit or a savings account or whatever but i'm going to I'm going to add my value on top of it to cater specifically to the needs and problems of this particular market segment and, um, and and serve that market segment. And that's really, to me, the job of FinTech. You're distributing a manufactured financial product. You're giving it your own character and flavor and you're focusing on a particular niche. And the third bucket, which is where you know Zera was formed, is the technology service provider bucket, which is where we're building the technology and the platforms that will power both the manufacturers and the distributors, which is the banks and the FinTechs. Uh, by giving them a modern platform that enables them to bring, you know, uh, fruition to their vision and Im imagination. If you want. All right, we'll take a couple more questions. Um, we have some show of hands. Hello, sir. My name is Sudha. I'm from Kolkata, Gujarat. So my question is: While starting a new startup, how to manage the enormous competition around the world? So actually, this is where I guess the exploration exploitation piece also comes in, right? I believe the best way to start is to find something that nobody else is doing. And it, it can be a positioning. It doesn't mean that, I mean, it's very, you know, some people might arguably say that, oh, almost everything that, I, that I'm talking about is being done. And for sure it's being done. And I'll tell you the way to think about it is, if a person has a problem, for the most part, they're doing something about that problem today. Like, you know, um, before email existed, we communicated. It's not that human communication didn't exist. Before instant messaging existed, before social media existed, before search engines existed, you know, I was born and I operated on my computer science stuff, you know, during a time when there were no search engines. In fact, the first search engine I ever used was Alta Vista back in like 94. Um, but we still had a way to go out there and find knowledge and get questions answered. So it's not that problems are not being solved. People, if they have a problem, will find a hackish or a quick way or some way to solve it. So your issue is not about, you know, there are very few unsolved problems. Your issue is to figure out that can you find a problem space where the problem is not being solved in an elegant way and you are able to provide something that's 3x, 5x, 10x better to solve that same problem. 
Um, and, and that Vx, 5x, 10x beta might be a function of ideas that you thought that nobody else thought of, or it might be a function of, you know, that problem only became big recently. Until now, nobody cared about it as much, basically, but now people are starting to care about it, right? Or um, it's a function of um, technology has caught up, you know, technology has reached a point where the previous way of solving the problem wasn't as elegant or great. Now there's a new way of doing things that might be substantially better. By the way, all of you folks have the great opportunity of being at an inflection point. Like I started out my companies when, when the internet was just starting out in some sense. AI is going to have a far more profound impact and a far bigger impact. So the opportunity landscape has just opened up, ten, you know, multi-fold. Uh, but you need to find that space where there is a clear pain point, a pain point that people care about, and that you have far more elegant solution because of you know multiple confluence factors, whether it's technology, whether it's you know ideation, combination of both, etc. And so you know it's always it's always better to start out where you've defined yourself. You might still be sitting in and build an HR software, or build a search engine, or build a you know customer support tool, or whatever it is. So the space exists, um, but you found a way to basically create something new in that space such that you're never head on competing with somebody that's up. You're kind of in the left field and at some point the past might merge because you start taking more market share from incumbents uh, by doing things differently. So you always want to try and find that problem space um, you know, where, where you can actually make a meaningful differentiation. That's why I believe. so. I talk about this, you know, what I call discovery implementation measurement um, framework. Um, a lot of us, every one of us has the ability to keep ourselves busy. That's very easy. To do. So if, if I tell you work 14 hours and that's your life, you can find work 14 hours. So really the differentiator is what you're working on, not the fact that you're working 14 hours a day, right? And in any given you know, time span, whether you choose a year or five years or even a sprint or six months or whatever it is. I strongly believe, so you, you need to spend at least 33% or more of your time in the discovery phase where you're actually spending time to figure out what problem I want to solve. You spend about 33% of your time in the implementation phase. That's the actual work. And then you spend all maybe about 40% and then you spend about 20% of time in reflecting on because it'll happen every single time. Why is it that your hypothesis failed and you did all this work but didn't achieve the outcome that you were supposed to achieve? And so then that loops you back for a far better discovery journey because if you fail, you're like some assumption that I made about choosing this problem went wrong. So let me go back and start once again on discovery. Now you do this on a, you know, on different scale levels. If you're building a product, each sprint, you're doing this in the level of a feature. If you're building a business, you're doing this in the level of a product. If you're building multiple businesses, you're doing this in the level of a business. But it fundamentally remains the same. You have to give enough time to discovery um, to be able to choose the right problem and then basically, you know, focus on solving it. And actually, for the most part, you find that the actual work that it takes to code is nothing. It's actually the smallest quantum of unit in, in don't mean to undermine what you guys do on a daily basis, but it's actually really the smallest part of the entire equation. Writing software to do something is actually the the trivial part. What you're doing today is learning the possibilities, right? The, the the more complex part is figuring out what you should write, figuring out what you should do, figuring out which problem space you should select. That's really where the differentiation is. So the more intuition you gain out there, the more time you spend in that measurement phase and reflect. And the biggest problem I find this applies to even your personal lives. And you know, if you're sort of starting a company or in the entrepreneurship path. A lot of us spend 10% of the time in discovery, 90% of the time doing work, zero time in figuring out what went wrong, and then once again start them. And so we're never learning lessons from you know what failed in our hypothesis and just keeping ourselves busy all the time. Then we still question saying, I'm working so hard, but like nothing is you know succeeding. And more often than not, it's largely because you're spending far more time doing the work than the time that you need to spend in figuring out what you should chase. So Hello, sir. Uh, I'm Omish Ran. I'm from Indore. I have a question and then I have a follow up question regarding that. It is a very big time question. Um, you really talked about your fundamentals and value that have driven you. And coming from such humble background, 
and like the way uh, you told about your childhood and the whole journey. I mean, being you were good at maths and you enjoyed right, and you all uh, also told us that like you mentioned the Aero Dover. We we do have some like relatable questions we have come through. Um, when we are good at something, it's it's not of mother. It's hard for us to leave that because like we feel when if we are good at it, if even something goes worst, we will do something in it. I mean, uh, uh, you told that you are good at maths, and the conventional path is that who is good at maths go for engineering and go for that stable job thing, and that that's the societal thing that is being formed and uh, that is conveyed to us also. Uh, but how did you had that conviction initially? to entirely change the uh, path and go to the commerce thing because you told that you had that vision and uh, i have to do something with computer science and i can start on something of my own but uh, you you still took time uh, in figuring out ki what i need to get started in what really gave you that confidence that you know what even if something was happen i'm ready to take on that risk because we have gone through kind of same journey Uh, our parents and everyone out there was just telling us, uh, "Are you sure you're gonna go with BSc over Big Tech and all the all of this?" And it was kind of overwhelming at beginning points. But uh, I really want to know how did you manage to stick to that? Because that's you 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 told right? you you lived in a that teacher's uh, kind of room and that was a two uh, like that was a room and ten people were out there. So I mean, we really really need that firm faith in ourselves. Ki, how do we keep going? And I'm sorry, I'm shivering out there. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah. And yeah. no, no, I can't speak. My next chair. So that's the thing. One moment. Ki, then that fear popped in. Ah, uh, ki, how you gonna deal with it? If you gonna fail or like, what gonna be consequences that could come into your family too? Also, the second question is that uh, I understood. Ki, you really talked about. Ki, what values? of uh, you are driven from but when we are building a startup or organization it's not us who going to do everything we have to delegate things so so how means we can control our values our models our what how we going to process but how do we assure that our organization is also value driven i mean how do we trust people out there for a very important role that ki you know what uh, this is going to go well these were the two questions Thank you for that. Sure. So just to summarize the first question, you had no safety net in form of formal education that could have got you a job in case that entire field at that point of time. You know, BSc, BCom, BTech. I can tell you in a in your lifetime, these labels are not going to matter at all. What's going to matter is the output that you that you create. The labels are are useful for. de-risking for filtering and for those kinds of things but work speaks for itself and you will always have the opportunity to kind of make that happen even far more so this day, these days and for you know there was no social media and online profiles and so on and so forth back then now the the um, world is more and more becoming a meritocracy and fundamentally what will matter is is the output that you folks produce and many ways to showcase that output um I think conviction comes from. I mean, I would say early on for me it came from a lot of these biographies that I read, a lot of stories that I heard, and I mean I do believe entrepreneurship always requires a healthy dose of delusion. You have to have that. You have to have that. So conviction and delusion, are, you know, this thin boundary between uh, between both. I mean, hopefully don't cross over to full on delusion, but it does require that. And uh, when you see other individuals. Who made their fair share of mistakes? Who come from equally humble backgrounds? Uh, when you hear stories about it, you develop that conviction yourself that you, you know, if they can do it, so can I. Um, you spoke about failure. Um, you know, it's actually a favorite topic of mine. We can actually have a two-hour session on just failure. Uh, I think it's a very, very important subject. I think it should actually. be a part of curriculums in fact in terms of enabling individuals to reframe the connotation of failure i remember i um, i went to this um, silicon valley gathering there was a professor out there who was talking about entrepreneurship some decade and a half ago and 
one of the questions that was asked was, you know, why is it that so many successful companies are all emanating from this sort of 10 square mile radius called the Silicon Valley in, in literally the other end of the world. And you can attribute various reasons. There's a lot of capital available out here. There's, you know, great colleges, so there's good talent and things like that. But he ended by saying that the most important reason is fairly early on in San Francisco and Silicon Valley, they created a culture of celebrating failures. Mm -hmm. Failure wasn't something to look down upon. You'll find individuals that have failed once, twice, thrice, and people are actually wanting to fund them the fourth time because now you know that the, the individual has actually, you know, learned so much and, and that experience is valuable, right? So that whole notion of celebrating failures per se. Uh, I also sort of I read this somewhere else, um, I, I don't remember the source, that, you know, even in terms of the word, by the way, the word failure was always ascribed to an event. So you attempted a task and the task did not succeed and therefore that event was a failure. And for some reason in the Indian culture, one of the things that, you know, I have found has become very unfortunate and it's not just India, but I see that more, you know, more than I'm comfortable with here is that we attribute to a person saying you are a failure. But there's what the actual definition of the word has nothing to do, no connotation with the individual. How can an individual be a failure? An individual is just, you know, atoms and molecules, right? It's a, it's an actual object. The failure is actually an event, not the person. But a lot of individuals start taking it upon themselves that I'm a failure. It just happens to be that you might have had multiple events of failure. And I can tell you there's not a single successful person in the world except people who perhaps won a lottery that have achieved that success without a multiplied number of failures in comparison to that success, right? So you're no different from anybody else um, in that regards. So this whole notion, that's why I said earlier also, right, that the valleys actually even change the world, right? We don't call it failure anymore, we call it pivot. So I just pivoted. It's a much, it's a much better, it's, there's no difference in definition, it's just reframing. And this innate ability to reframe failure as a positive thing is actually a unique ingredient for a vast majority of successful entrepreneurs. So they don't think of failure as, um, you know, an individual attribute, they don't think of failure as something bad. They just think of it as a stepping stone in the journey to, um, to achieving an outcome. I'll say the same thing applies to success, by the way. And that's what I was trying to say earlier. Don't spend your life chasing success because success is like failure. It's a binary outcome. What will happen after that? You know, if you set a goal and you succeed at it, you, it's done. And that's it, it's over. Pursue mastery. Because that's a lifetime pursuit. You can never achieve it. Because there's always more to achieve in the pursuit of mastery. And in that pursuit, both success and failures just become milestones. They're irrelevant. Because no matter what, if you look at any period of time, you might fail in Q1, you might have another failure in Q2, you might have a third failure in Q3. But if you look at five years, you're better off today than you were five years ago in terms of knowledge, experience, exposure, growth, etc. So in that pursuit to mastery, there's no success or failure. They're just in between milestones. Um, that pursuit is a lifetime pursuit, a lifetime rewarding pursuit because you always have something more you can chase, something to look forward to in terms of growth, um, and so on and so forth. So, so I think it comes from, as I said, I would say it's you know company that you keep. For me, it was the books that I read. That's where the inspiration came from. That's where the conviction came from. All of us have it within us to, um, to, to really achieve magic. So that's on your, uh, on your first question. On the, on the second question with regards to kind of creating a value driven culture, I mean, I think, uh, Reid Hoffman says that, you know, it's important to sort of the first 150 people that he brings into his organization, he actually makes sure he personally interviews and personally inducts in, right? That's the num magic number for him. Um, um, Coincidentally and apparently, I mean, I've done the same. I mean, I, I have in most of my organizations, all my companies, I still take a lot of interviews even now, but in general, I've been very, very instrumental to kind of bring in that initial team and so on and so forth. But I also believe that if you truly, you as an organization, you as a founder or a set of founders truly believe in and walk the walk, you automatically rally people around that same cause and automatically attract individuals with the same value system. And the individuals who don't have the same value system for for the most part, we'll automatically find other places where they have a value system match. Um, and so even if you make a mistake there, I found invariably it automatically normalizes itself um, over time. And people will rally around their purpose, right? People will rally around 
again goals of like monetary rewards they are all short term goals i mean short term in a lifetime sense like right? um you achieve them and you come to the other side you're like okay you know it's done it's over with but pursuing a purpose that that can be a lifetime journey and people will rally around that purpose if you have a purpose for your company and one of my favorite books is simon sinek start with why that if you start with your why and if you create a purpose people will rally around that purpose people will rally around your value system if they say you know why behind that so um i think earlier we were talking about some of the aspects and fundamentals of curriculum at scaler and i love the notion that you said that before teaching a skill let's talk about why is the skill needed and when you establish that then you're creating the it's like inception the movie you're creating an innate intrinsic hunger and drive and desire to want to pursue that path as opposed to money is always an extrinsic motivation all the other factors are you know fame recognition they're all extrinsic motivation but if if i if i align you with my purpose and i show you the why and you believe in that and it becomes your purpose and now it's a shared purpose then there's intrinsic motivation to pursue that path and that's you know as judy capio says that's like so deep rooted and deep seated now within your mind that all the actions that you take will be guided by that great thank you so much um We'll take one last question, and then we are a little bit over time right now. We'll take one last question, maybe all the way from the back there. Um, and while he walks over, so you know, obviously, Bhavan spoke a lot about the books he's read. We're actually going to take a recommendation list uh, of the books that he recommends that all of you should read. I will share that uh, with all of you as well. So, in case those are interesting for you, please go out uh, and read those books as well. So, uh, we spoke about this just uh, a few few hours ago, but we'll get that list across to you. All right. Hi, Mavin. I am Ajit Smart from Kolkata. So, my question is that uh, now that you are a successful entrepreneur, what advice would you give to like 19 year, 19 year old self, basically young entrepreneurs like us, now that you have seen and changed quite a lot of things? Great. It's interesting to see, by the way, that every single student is from a different city. So. completely yeah. random selection and yet i haven't seen a single overlap so far um i mean i think i covered a lot of those points per se i think uh, one thing that i would really um, drill down on is that whole discovery and exploration uh, versus exploitation phase a lot of people just directly jump to exploitation and i think exploration is actually far more important than exploitation um also it enables you to then craft that purpose align people understand the problem space and domain etc things like that so um i think starting from first principles the ability to do that is great it helps you come up with a fresh perspective but do not undermine the value that experience and knowledge in a domain brings in to be able to marry both of them and truly then figure out that the same problem space works on it and i feel like had i known that in many occasions spent more time on the discovery phase whether it was a business or a product or even a feature in some places i would have wasted less of capital because i built a bunch of products that didn't work or spent time on areas and ideas that actually were nonsensical didn't make any sense um and if i had spent a bit more time in discovery rather than investing myself all the way in committing to building it all out um i would have saved time and capital i think i would have made a bigger impact in in um in my life if i had picked right problem space and again you know it's all hindsight is 2020 i have no regrets on everything that i did but i think that's one thing i would go back and say well spend more time in discovery and truly understanding that domain space what you're trying to do what you're trying to achieve before committing yourself so heartedly to it in the exploitation phase um i'm a huge uh, huge fan of okrs i know there is a part of your curriculum um i preach about that everywhere i feel like you know i should have discovered that as a tool it's, it's very very useful for and again there's no you know um guaranteed path to success and there's different ways to do different things i can talk about my experience it's been a useful tool to align individuals to set this it's almost like a framework for being able to set the right goals and objectives question them and provide this right framework for um um aligning the team setting line of sight and so on and so forth so i certainly would have uh, um incorporated that sooner in my life i wish um as a tool or a framework um 
Yeah, those are two that come to mind right now. Great, thank you so much. All right, we'll pause our questions here because I know we are almost over time. But I have one last you know thing for you to kind of share with students. You know, Bhav has been really kind enough to spend pretty much the entire day with us. Uh, he's gone down in the detail of actually seeing the entire curriculum, exactly what all of you are learning over the next 18 months, then the internship, and then what comes after as well. He's given us a lot of inputs and insights on how we could uh, do better as well. Uh, also, came to the micro campus. I think he walked into a couple of uh, student rooms as well. Uh, checked out the mess, checked out you know where you guys uh, hang out most of the time, and of course has been spending most of his day here with us. So he's been extremely kind with his time. Thank you so much again, Harvey, for doing that. But after everything we learned over the last six hours that you spent at Scalar School Technology, one thing you want to leave our students with? I guess I leave you with pretty much the same fundamental advice that my father kept ingraining into us. Um, and I'll repeat it once again for you folks. I strongly believe it that every one of you can achieve anything you set your mind to. And uh, and strongly internalize that every single one of you. I mean, it is uh, it has made a profound difference to my life. And, and I, I live it every day along with you know, a lot of individuals uh, in our organization. But I, I strongly believe every one of you can achieve anything you set your mind to. So take that belief with you. Well, it's not often that you get a chance to hear from Bhavan himself on campus. So, big round of applause for Bhavan to be here.